Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Brian Gettle. I'm the Associate Director of Advocacy at Exact Sciences, and we are privileged to be part of the Prevent Cancer Foundation's annual Dialogue for Action Conference, and specifically for this session, uh, Colorectal Cancer Screening Challenges, where we will address the intersection of COVID-19 uh, related screening declines, health disparities, and a lowered screening age. Um, we are privileged to be joined today uh, by Dr. Paul Lindbergh, our Chief Medical Officer of Screening, as well as Dr. Dorado Brooks, our Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Screening. Uh, over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so, uh, we will providing, we'll be providing an overview of exact sciences. Uh, from there, we'll transition into an overview of colorectal cancer screening and specifically hitting three topic areas, uh, health disparities, COVID-19, and on the heels of the uh, USPSTF final recommendation to uh, lower the screening age to 45, uh, we will cover screening at 45 as well. Uh, then we will provide an overview of MTSDNA, which is known commercially as Cologuard, uh, and then of course leave time at the end to uh, answer your questions. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Paul and Dorado, and uh, Paul, I will uh, hand it off uh, to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some information around those key topics that you outlined. And if we could go to the next slide, we just wanted to start out with uh, what drives us at Exact Sciences. So we are all about trying to reduce the cancer burden. We're trying to change lives through earlier detection and smarter answers for cancer patients along that cancer continuum. On the next slide, just to demonstrate how we are set up organizationally to deliver on that uh, vision. So the screening business unit is one that might be most familiar to the audience. That's where we uh, activate all of our Cologuard opportunities. But we also have now uh, colleagues across four other business units. Our precision oncology team is responsible for the Oncotype DX suite of products. Uh, which provides smarter answers for clinicians. We've got an international team that brings primarily those Oncotype DX products outside of the United States. Uh, most recently, we've been working uh, and uh, collaborating with our new colleagues at Thrive on multi-cancer screening, which is uh, more a uh, future product and really in the late stages of development. And then we've also got a robust pipeline team, over 400 employees at Exact Sciences who are working in our R&D space trying to come up with new markers, new technologies in order to uh, find uh, early detection assays and uh, treatment uh, methodologies that help us to do an even better job than we can do with our current portfolio. Just to point out that as the pandemic has uh, uh, hit and, and taken over since uh, 2020, Exact Science has also dedicated uh, some laboratory space and, and talent to uh, bring up a COVID-19 test to also help be part of the uh, global conversation and uh, solutioning around how can we provide more access to COVID-19 testing as well. So diving into the uh, topics that Brian covered on the next slide, talk a little bit about the burden of colorectal cancer in the United States and what populations might be disproportionately affected. On the next slide, this is all familiar to the audience, uh, colorectal cancer being the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States, um, pointing out contextually that colorectal cancer deaths are projected to be higher than both pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, a number of other cancers uh, in the United States, and really accounting for uh, nearly 10% of all cancer deaths uh, in, in the uh, country uh, based on 2021 projections. Next slide. And as we pointed out uh, early on, and, and as the audience is well aware, uh, there are populations that are uh, adversely affected, disproportionately affected uh, with respect to colorectal cancer incidence and mortality. And we're still trying to think through exactly what the factors are that are associated with some of these inequities. But on this slide, you can see uh, data showing both on the left colorectal cancer incidence, uh, the five different colored bars, the uh, purple bar is non-Hispanic blacks, uh, and then uh, different population groups ranging from American Indian, Alaska Native, non-Hispanic white, Hispanic Latino, and Asian Pacific Islanders. But you can see that that purple bar for both incidence and mortality is dramatically higher for black Americans than it is for other uh, groups uh, that are uh, categorized with uh, different race, ethnicity, 
uh, 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 subgroups. So we don't fully understand this, but we know that incidence rates are about 20% higher for uh, black Americans than they are for other populations. We know that mortality is about 40% higher and nearly double for black Americans than for Asian Pacific Islanders. This is due to a combination of factors, uh, which includes socioeconomic uh, considerations, uh, access to high quality uh, treatment, but also uh, differences in access to, to uh, preferred screening tests. Next slide. The, the nice opportunity with colorectal cancer is that it is truly one of the most preventable and treatable forms of malignancy. Uh, the window of opportunity for colorectal cancer really is amenable to early detection. We believe that we know the precursor lesion for most colorectal cancers, 70% uh, are thought to develop uh, maybe even higher from, from benign adenomas or even uh, serrated uh, lesions. And, and it typically takes 10 or more years to go from a benign lesion uh, to an invasive cancer. We know that early detection does have an impact. So the five-year survival rates for early stage cancers, be it stages one or two, the five-year survival rate is about 90%. Conversely, if you look at patients who are diagnosed at later stage, stage four disease, the five-year survival rate is only about 10%. So highlighting that early detection matters. On the next slide, this is the challenge that we are all working to address and, and improve. So these are the screening participation rates, and this is based on pre-pandemic data. So if you look at uh, national participation uh, in, in uh, colorectal cancer screening based on surveys, only about two thirds of screen eligible adults are up to date with current guidelines. We know that we've got uh, ability to continue to see that green line for colorectal cancer screening participation climb because there are um, settings like with cervical cancer and breast cancer uh, where the participation is higher and is close if not above that 80% uh, goal that's been set by the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable and endorsed by others. Next slide. And we do know that screening matters uh, based on uh, the information that I showed about the stage specific survival rates. Uh, another study that demonstrates the impact of screening from the Kaiser Permanente group, a retrospective assessment of patients who died of colorectal cancer within their health system, 76% were not up to date with colorectal cancer screening. Again, motivating all of us to do what we can to try to continue to drive forward with colorectal cancer screening uh, uh, for all groups. On the next slide, again, a different representation of some of the different uh, population uh, subgroups that uh, may have different participation in screening rates, even um, uh, putting a finer level of detail on the 67% the overall rate that I showed earlier. Uh, we've got some room to, to work with younger populations. Those who uh, were eligible to start screening at age 50 uh, uh, oftentimes uh, don't get started with screening, don't initiate screening uh, in the first few years that they would be eligible. We anticipate that that will continue to be a challenge now as we lower the age of initiation to 45. Mentioned that there are outcome disparities by race, ethnicity. There are also differences in screening participation across race, ethnicity defined populations. And then also on this graph, uh, those who have uh, lesser levels of education, those who have been in the country for shorter periods of time, those who are uninsured uh, also are not uh, as likely to be screened uh, for colorectal cancer or up to date with colorectal cancer screening. So some clear signals for where we can improve our early detection strategies and where we can all have more of an impact. With that, I will turn it to Dorado to talk a little bit about some of the challenges faced that we're facing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, and as we all know, COVID-19 totally disrupted our lives overall in our healthcare system. Uh, next slide, please, Brian. There were a number of things that um, happened early in the pandemic and frankly have lingered. Um, one, many cancer screenings were postponed or uh, just totally missed. Uh, patient fears about being in a healthcare environment, including even their private doctor's office, uh, escalated dramatically. And uh, recent data indicates there are still people who are reluctant to 
um, enter into a healthcare environment. And then finally, we had significantly reduced capacity for screening, uh, and in particular for colonoscopy, which requires that visit to the healthcare facility and a relatively sophisticated level of technology. Next slide. This is data that was projected back in late April or early May of 2020, so early in the pandemic. Looking at the trends they were seeing already at this point, this group uh, estimated that based on the fact that traditionally about 9.5 million colorectal cancer screenings occurred annually, from the fall that they had seen in March and April, they estimated that there were gonna be about a 90% drop in colonoscopies during that period of time, but this estimate was predicated upon a return to normal by June of 2020. Uh, but even with that return to normal by June, they estimated about 1.7 million fewer colonoscopies would occur over that three month period from March to um, uh, June. And that would result in nearly 19,000 delayed or missed colorectal cancer diagnoses. Again, projections, next slide. This data actually is not projection. This is data from a large database that includes uh, more than 60 million commercially insured and Medicare Advantage patients. And looking at this data uh, that was published just last month, they found that uh, as opposed to that 1.7 million missed screenings, the actual number was about 3.8 million between January and July of 2020. 3.8 million, so more than twice the estimate that came up in that prior projection. And notice that even in July, um, the 2020 uh, 20 was still significantly lower than the screening that was seen in 2019. Um, so this would imply that the other estimate of delayed and missed diagnoses also is a very significant underestimate. Next slide, please. Uh, based on this and other data, uh, Ned Sharpless, the NCI director, recently indicated that cancer diagnoses were down in the early part of 2020 by about 50%, and this, this lingered for a number of months. And there's no reason for us to believe that the actual incidence of cancer went down during that period of time, but the reality is it's likely because of those missed and delayed diagnoses and those diagnoses are going to become evident at some point in the future, and we're going to have excess cases and excess deaths as a result of those delays. Next slide. So a number of steps need to be taken to address, one, the lost gains. We all know we had been doing a very good job seeing steady year-over-year -year rises in colorectal cancer screening rates across the country, in particular since the 80% by 2018 campaign was launched uh, early in the last decade. Uh, but there is fear that those gains were lost in 2020, and we're going to have to figure out how to redouble our efforts in order to get back on track. Um, also, the concern about avoidable cancers and deaths as a result of those missed and delayed screenings, and then also the screening backlog. 3.8 million screenings that were missed in the first half of last year can't simply be absorbed by the system operating in the same fashion that it traditionally has. So we've got to do some things differently. Next slide. The National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable brought together a group of experts uh, last April and May to discuss what they saw as that very concerning downward trend in cancer screening and figure out how to get the nation back on track with cancer screening. Um, they came up with a, a number of recommendations for different segments and their recommendations for the community uh, had to do with uh, making sure that the full range of testing options was being offered and discussed. Um, that we recognize that screening disparities were already evident prior to COVID. And we know that the impact of COVID was felt disproportionately by many of those same communities that Paul just referenced as being underscreened. Uh, therefore, the impact of the screening disruptions may also disproportionately impact those communities unless we take proactive steps to avoid that worsening of the disparities. Um, we also need to make sure that we're addressing individuals who are at higher risk of developing colorectal cancer and that this is going to require close collaboration 
with between every partner involved in public health and uh, cancer screening overall. Uh, next slide. Some specific statements from the NCCRT playbook had to do with um, making sure that we continue to reinforce to the public and to the healthcare community that colorectal cancer remains a public health um, priority. And in part, that's because of not just the potential to find disease early, as Paul talked about, but the preventive value of screening. We need to continue to drive that message home and make people aware of the fact that even though we have other challenges and issues going on, we can't let colorectal cancer screening fall by the wayside. We also need to make sure that people know that colonoscopy as practiced nowadays is a safe and effective procedure. Um, most uh, endoscopy centers are now functioning at or near their pre-COVID capacity. Most have also made significant changes in their processes to decrease the risk of transmission of COVID or other infections. So getting an endoscopy now is a safe procedure. However, with the tremendous backlog that we have, we have to prioritize the endoscopy capacity that's available. So individuals who are known to be at higher risk for colorectal cancer need to move to the front of that line. Individuals who are symptomatic and those people who had a non-colonoscopy screening test that had an abnormal result, either uh, prior to the pandemic or early in the pandemic, they now need to get that follow-up colonoscopy. We also need to make sure that we are using all of the tools in our arsenal, which means increasing our utilization of stool tests, tests that people can use at home, help bypass one, any backlogs related to the pandemic disruptions and endoscopy facilities, but also help bypass those patient fears and concerns. And then finally, we need to make some changes to our healthcare policy environment that eliminates unnecessary barriers to people getting screened and getting the appropriate follow-up they need. In particular, the uh, cost associated with a follow-up colonoscopy after an abnormal stool test is something that it poses an unnecessary barrier and actually makes it harder for someone to get a test that they need after they've been identified as being at higher risk of having the disease. Um, I think I'm handing it back to Paul. Yeah, thanks, Dorado. Uh, I appreciate the review of those very important messages. And Clearly, uh, creativity and collaboration will be key as we try to do a better job in populations who are already eligible for screening but are underscreened. Uh, as we think through what the pandemic uh, is, is doing to our uh, availability, our access, our uh, awareness, our, uh, 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 our willingness for, for patients and providers to stay focused on colorectal cancer screening, and just to add one other prior, priority area of focus, and that is an expansion of the screen eligible population based on some emerging trends. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Great. So the uh, young onset uh, phenomenon that we're seeing with some of the colorectal cancer statistics, uh, again, is multifactorial and is at this point incompletely understood. But we do see that there are cancer, colorectal cancer incidence rate patterns that are changing in younger populations. On this slide, just a demonstration that in the uh, upper green line, uh, historically, uh, the colorectal cancer incidence rates for black Americans were higher uh, across all age groups. But if you look at um, patients who are under age 50 with colorectal cancer, you can see that the incidence rates for black Americans are staying relatively stable while well, they are increasing for uh, white Americans or non-Hispanic uh, white Americans. And, and all the way over on the right-hand uh, side of the graph, the rates for uh, colorectal cancer incidence in those under age 50 are now comparable, very similar for whites and for blacks. Next slide. And as we look at the modeling data to try to understand how can we uh, potentially reverse those trends, um, it, it, it's evident that doing, uh, it, initiating any of the endorsed screening strategies prior to age 50 uh, yields uh, public health benefits. So the green bars on this graph are the uh, life years gained from the different screening modalities uh, starting at age 50 and continuing to age 75. 
In the purple bars, the life years gained if screening is initiated at age 45. You can see with each of the different strategies that there are more life years gained by screening at a younger age, 45, instead of age 50. Next slide. And we're all pleased to say that the United States Preventive Services Task Force uh, has now joined other organizations with their most recent recommendation statements uh, to lower the age of screening to age 45, providing a grade B recommendation for those in that 45 to 49 year age group, continuing to support with an A grade recommendation, colorectal cancer screening for adults age 50 to 75 years at average risk. And again, continuing on with a grade C recommendation for uh, adults ages 76 to 85 years. On the next slide, what do these grades mean? Well, a grade A from USPSTF means that there is high certainty that the net benefit is substantial and that providers should offer this service. Similar for grade B, the, there is high certainty again that the benefit is at least moderate or there's moderate certainty that the net benefit is at least moderate. Uh, and this service should also be uh, offered uh, for that population. A grade C recommendation is a little bit more nuanced that there uh, may be a more individualized discussion and that uh, the uh, offered uh, strategies should be selectively discussed and provided to patients who meet those criteria. Next slide. So the notable updates in the 2021 uh, USPSTF uh, recommendation statements with respect to screening age, I think we've covered that reasonably well. The screening tests that have been uh, 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 recommended by USPSTF really are uh, uh, the same as what they've been in 2016 and what other guidelines support. Notice that there is no tiering of the different test options. All of these test options are considered uh, equal and should be selected based on an informed uh, conversation and, and shared decision-making between patients and providers. Um, in the third column over, the recommended screening intervals, um, the uh, blood-based stool test should be performed every uh, year for stool DNA fit or Coligard, as the commercial name would be, uh, every one to three years. And for the direct visualization test, no change in the intervals uh, between 2021 and the 2016 USPSTF guidelines. Uh, there was a call out uh, in, in the 2021 uh, final recommendations that we need to do more to address disparities for all the reasons that we've talked about uh, already in this conversation, but making sure that we can do whatever we can to um, provide effective, accessible screening options to Black Americans and other populations who have traditionally been under underscreened. Next slide. So what does this uh, relate to in terms of uh, how big of uh, opportunity uh, is now uh, provided uh, through this shift to a lower age screening? Um, if we can click one more time, 19 million estimated individuals in that 45 to 49 year old age group who would now be eligible for average risk colorectal cancer screening. So more opportunity for us to truly impact uh, lives by earlier detection where we know that uh, the ability to uh, detect cancer early and even prevent cancer from happening by identifying precancerous lesions uh, is real and is something that will require us for, uh, to, to collaborate and to uh, do uh, more strategic thinking about how we can reach these younger individuals. Next slide. And I'll turn it back to Dorado to uh, start a conversation about the MTS DNA test. Uh, thanks again, Paul. Uh, Brian, you can move on to the next slide. So Cologuard, we view as an important element of solving uh, many of the problems we've already identified. Uh, so it's important that everyone understand uh, what Cologuard is and, and the indications for its use and when it should not be used. Um, Cologuard is indicated to find um, DNA markers as well as uh, occult hemoglobin in stool that may indicate the presence of colorectal neoplasia, both um, cancers and advanced adenomas. Um, it's also important to know that individuals who have an abnormal finding, a positive finding on Cologuard, must have that follow-up colonoscopy that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Cologuard is indicated to screen adults ages 45 and older, and that's an important point uh, because, to my knowledge, Cologuard is the only test that has actually gotten approval from FDA to be marketed as a screening tool 
for individuals uh, starting at age 45. Um, Cologuard's intended for use in average risk patients, so it's important that a risk assessment be done prior to uh, recommending Cologuard or any other non-colonoscopy screening test. Uh, in particular, we need to make sure that patients don't have a personal history of colorectal cancer or uh, advanced adenomas, that patients don't have a, a family history of colorectal cancer, that there's no history of inflammatory bowel disease or other high-risk conditions like Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis. Next slide, please. Um, Cologuard's performance has been evaluated in a cross-sectional study. The main trial that you often see referred to, the, um, the deep sea study, was a cross-sectional study looking at a, a single point in time performance of Cologuard uh, compared with other uh, screening modalities. So the programmatic performance of Cologuard over time, over a series of screening, has not yet been evaluated, although there are studies underway. Uh, similarly, the performance of, of Cologuard um, beyond that uh, cross-sectional study uh, in comparison with other screening modalities and, and uh, looking at the impact on morbidity and mortality from colorectal cancer uh, also has not been evaluated in studies, although the modeling studies have uh, made some estimates of uh, the potential impact. Um, the clinical validation study, the deep sea study that I mentioned was performed primarily in patients ages 50 and older. Um, so with regard to the uh, approval for use in the 45 plus population, um, that was um, provided based largely on um, uh, estimates from a near age group population, although we have subsequently published data on color guard performance in the 45 to 49 year old population. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that the screening guidelines for individuals over the age of 75, as was mentioned by Paul, um, fall into that C category, that is, it should be an individualized decision. Uh, and when, when it comes to color guard, it's important to keep that in mind because um, the rate of false positive results in older patients tends to increase as individuals age. A negative Cologuard result does not guarantee the absence of cancer or advanced adenoma. So patients who have a negative finding on Cologuard should be encouraged to continue screening in a programmatic fashion with Cologuard or other recommended screening tests. Uh, individuals with a negative finding should also be cautioned that if new symptoms should develop, they should not ignore those symptoms based solely on the prior history of a negative Cologuard, and they need to follow up with their provider and assess what may be causing those symptoms. And then finally, Cologuard, like any other test, can produce both false negative and false positive results. Uh, so individuals need to, uh, again, always con consult their provider um, with the onset of any uh, new concerns. Next slide. Um, Patients need to be cautioned not to collect their Cologuard sample if they have diarrhea or if they have uh, other sources of bleeding, um, such as hemorrhoids, uh, blood in their urine or their stool or, or during menstruation. Um, in order to make sure that the sample uh, is um, viable, we need to receive the sample in our lab within 72 hours of collection and information on appropriate sample collection and handling is provided uh, in the Cologuard patient guide that comes along with every collection kit. Uh, patients should also be advised not to drink the preservative liquid that's designed to be added to the stool specimen. Uh, and then finally, the risk associated with the collection kit are very low, but patients should be cautioned uh, to be careful when they're opening and closing the lids on the collection container uh, to avoid any risk of hand strain. Next slide. As I mentioned, we, we view Cologuard as an important component of solving um, these issues, this trifecta of pressure that we now find on colorectal cancer screening related to the expanded screening population, that 19 million people that, that Paul mentioned, the impact of COVID-19 with the disruptions in care and the delays, the loss to follow up, um, and the, the diminished capacity for screening that was experienced. And then finally, the uh, disparities that were 
already existent in, in the pre-COVID area. We want to do everything we can to avoid worsening those disparities and hopefully decrease those disparities by a more concerted effort at using all screening tools available, including ColeGuard and other stool tests. Next slide. And the importance of screening option has been called out in essentially every guideline. Uh, the ACS back in 2018, when they initially lowered the screening age to 45, um, stated that offering a choice of screening tests leads to improved uptake. Uh, the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force, which is a consortium of GI organizations, talks about the importance of sequential offerings of screening tests. And then the U.S. PSTF guidelines that were just released um, specifically say identifying screening tests that are more likely to be completed by a given individual is a, a important component of that informed and uh, shared decision-making discussion. So patients need to know they have choices. If we want to get them screened, allow them to choose the test that's going to work best for them. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, Gerardo. So um, just for awareness, I, I think to really be able to have that conversation between patients, providers, or uh, with advocates who are trying to encourage um, uh, the people that they engage with to, to get appropriately screened, uh, we need to understand uh, the specifics of the test. So with respect to the multi-target stool DNA test or Coligard, uh, the FDA expansion of the label uh, to include uh, age 45 to 49 year olds was done after the American Cancer Society guidelines came out in 2018. So. Coligard is an appropriate available option for younger adults uh, beginning uh, at age 45 who are at average risk. Next slide. And here's how the biology works. So the Coligard test includes 10 markers um, that are based on uh, DNA or hemoglobin. Um, and the uh, DNA markers include both methylation markers and mutation markers. These uh, DNA markers are sloughed from the abnormal uh, surface of, of lesions that may occur then in the colorectum. So on the cartoon, you can see uh, going from a small polyp to larger stages of precancerous polyps and then all the way to invasive cancers, the surface area for uh, those different neoplasms uh, increases and thus provides more um, uh, uh, potential for the sloughed DNA, sloughed cellular markers to be identified in stool. Um, the hemoglobin markers also as the blood uh, supply, the vasculature to these uh, polyps increases uh, as they um, grow in size, uh, provides an opportunity for the hemoglobin um, levels to also be incorporated into the multi-marker algorithm that then provides a positive or negative result for the test. Next slide. Every Coligard order also comes with navigation support. This is accessible for both patients and providers. Um, there is customer care or navigation support available uh, seven days a week, 365 days uh, a year, 24 hours a day. Uh, and it's also available in over 240 languages. So if somebody has questions and English is not their uh, preferred language, uh, there are services available to try to walk through the instructions and answer any questions that patients or providers may have through any one of a number of different connection channels. Next slide. And there are some data from real world studies that show that this combination of, of markers, uh, a molecularly based approach coupled with the navigation support uh, has a tremendous impact. In one of the studies that was done uh, shortly after Coligard became clinically available from uh, a health system uh, in uh, Texas, they looked at um, a population that had been previously unscreened. These were all Medicare patients, nearly 400. And of those 393 previously non-adherent patients, uh, they found that after Coligard was available and offered, 88.3% completed a Coligard test within a 12-month period. Perhaps uh, equally or more importantly, of those 51 patients who had a positive Coligard test result, 49, 96%, went on to have uh, the follow-up colonoscopy uh, to further interrogate uh, what may have uh, contributed to that positive uh, Coligard result. So showing that patients can be motivated with uh, access to a, a molecular test like uh, the multi-target stool DNA test and that they are willing to follow through uh, and complete the screening process. Next slide. 
Uh, right now, Cologuard patients, 94% have no out-of-pocket costs for uh, that initial screening uh, evaluation. And we're working with multiple stakeholder groups to try to continue to uh, increase that number uh, as close to 100% as we can. Next slide. And also for populations uh, and, and uh, air geographic regions that are covered by Medicaid, um, Coligard is now covered by Medicaid uh, in 74 per, for 74% of the Medicaid population. Um, and uh, we are uh, proud to say that this uh, slide continues to, to evolve uh, as we, uh, again, uh, work with different states to make sure that uh, Coligard is available to all patients, uh, including those who are covered by Medicaid. Next slide. And, and here's the numbers to date. Over 5 million people have been screened with Cologuard uh, since its clinical launch. 43% uh, in a, a survey that was conducted of Cologuard users had said they had never been screened previously. Uh, and when uh, the uh, Exact Sciences lab team uh, explored the completion rates uh, from Cologuard order to Cologuard completion in the Medicare population, nearly 365,000 individuals. The completion rate or the adherence was 71%. Next slide. Uh, we're also working hard, uh, again, to uh, make sure that uh, Exact Sciences uh, is uh, part of the uh, solution to, to addressing uh, health inequities. There is now a health equity team at Exact Sciences and the mission for that team is to empower patients uh, and the colon cancer community more broadly with quality information, the right information, with those resources uh, and materials that are needed to support screening decisions uh, and other choices so that we can together eradicate the disease and save lives. Uh, the strategic focus is to increase access and screening for the most disparate and vulnerable populations. And we're also pleased to say that we are working with uh, multiple partners in, in order to uh, follow through on, on that mission and strategy. Next slide. One of those key partnerships is working with the Prevent Cancer Foundation on the back on the books campaign, uh, where we hope that we can uh, do our part to make uh, test options accessible and to educate uh, patients who uh, may be interested in uh, a stool-based non-invasive uh, screening strategy at home uh, especially given some of the factors that we reviewed uh, earlier in today's conversation. Next slide. So just to sum up, uh, reversing the declines that we're seeing uh, in, in colorectal cancer screening participation uh, is possible. Um, with the expansion of the screening population, we've got even more that we need to do together. Uh, and we clearly need to make sure that we are focused on providing quality screening for, for all screen eligible adults. This requires new and innovative collaborations. We need to leverage all screening options and we need to work on real and systematic change so that we can achieve our common goals. And I'll close our presentation with this perspective from uh, Exact Sciences Chairman and CEO, Kevin Conroy. We know at Exact Sciences that cancer doesn't stop for anything. As we all continue to face the challenges uh, posed by the pandemic and other factors, we, we will monitor the coronavirus uh, 19 uh, effects on our ability to uh, follow through on our mission to reduce the colorectal cancer and other cancer burden. But our team remains steadfast and committed to delivering answers to patients around the world who may benefit from our tests. With that, thank you for your attention. And now I'll bring Brian back into the conversation. Thanks, Dr. Lindbergh and Dr. Brooks for that presentation, and we'll now uh, use the balance of our time to uh, take your questions. And we see many of you uh, have already submitted questions. We did go a little bit over, so apologies in advance if we're not able to get to everyone's. Um, if you see uh, up on the slide, um, if we don't get to your question, you are welcome to uh, send an email to me and we will get back to you, or if you just would prefer to handle it separately, uh, that is certainly fine as well. So you can email that to Brian Gettle at bgettle at exactsciences.com. Um, the first question I will uh, give to, uh, to Dr. Brooks, uh, there's concern at, that as the CRC screening age has been lowered, we may uh, see disparities widen. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Brooks? Um, sadly, that is one potential, uh, but the reality is, uh, as Paul already pointed out, we've got glaring disparities in colorectal cancer screening and outcomes uh, that have existed for many years. 
So it ultimately comes down to us, us in the, the colorectal cancer screening community, the public health community, and ultimately the provider community to make sure that these new guidelines are implemented in a way that will not uh, reinforce those disparities. We also know that part of these disparities are because of our col uh, colonoscopy focused approach to colorectal cancer screening. And let's face it, there are a significant number of people who don't want or can't get a colonoscopy. So making sure that we are taking advantage of all of the potential screening options, as is pointed out by all of the guidelines, is another way to help decrease the potential for worsening disparities. And frankly, even possibly decrease the disparities that existed prior to this. And Dorado, another one for you. Do you think our artificial foods and food sourcing and the standard American diet are contributing to this trend in colorectal cancer incidence, especially among younger populations? Um, there are a lot of hypotheses about what is going on and, and the likelihood is that it is a, uh, there are multiple factors and uh, it, Probably there is a dietary component to it. I mean, we know that uh, over the uh, a similar period of time that we've been seeing these rising rates uh, of uh, young onset colorectal cancer, we've also seen increasing rates of um, obesity and obesity in younger people, increasing rates of diabetes in younger people. Uh, and those are potential um, uh, elements that are contributing to what we're seeing. So uh, diet is certainly not the answer, but it may be part of the answer. And Paul, one for you. Uh, can you talk, speak a bit to the trends in uh, colorectal cancer for Native American and Alaska Native populations? And if, if those trends aren't available, do you feel it's because of the disparities for Natives? And is there anything that, that can be done to capture this data? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, clearly, there are differences in, in those populations as well. Um, in fact, there are some uh, tribes uh, who have higher, the highest colorectal cancer incidence rates uh, in the country. Um, collectively, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native uh, rates have gone down over the last many years, uh, but we still have room to grow because those rates remain higher than non-Hispanic whites, for example. Uh, data are tracked uh, uh, according to different race ethnicity subgroups, including uh, Alaska Native American Indian populations as well. So I think that we've got robust data sources. Now we need to act on those data to interrupt those trends. Thanks, Paul. Dorado, uh, another for you. Given the um, the low uptake in, in colorectal cancer screening among black men, can you discuss possible strategies or approaches to address this reluctance? Um, well, one simple approach that I utilized when I was in practice and that I think still is in effect is get to the women in their lives. So if there is a, a mother, a sister, a, a wife, or a, a, a significant other making sure that they appreciate the importance of colorectal cancer screening for the men in their lives. And then going to those men directly in number one, again, we come back to the issue of options. I know a lot of the reluctance that I uh, experience when I talk to uh, men in general, not just black men, about colorectal cancer screening was an immediate vision of colonoscopy, and that's something they had no interest in. So making sure that they know that there are options out there. And then reinforcing the, the value of screening in that we're not just talking about finding cancer, although finding it early makes a huge difference in outcomes, but there is the potential for prevention uh, by doing colorectal cancer screening. So making sure all those messages are getting through to them, but again, use the women in their lives to help influence them. All right, and we have about a minute left, so time for one more, but real quick before, Paul, I, I, I give you the last one. Uh, uh, just a friendly reminder that the next session does start at 2.55 Eastern time. So you'll have about five minutes uh, to transition and take a break to get from one to the next. So, Paul, with that, the last question, uh, with the new guidelines lowering the screening age to 45, how will this affect current screening rate measures such as BRFSS? Yeah, thanks, Brian. The BRFSS uh, survey conducted by CDC colleagues um, over 400 interviews with adult Americans across 50 states each year. Uh, we would anticipate we'll have even richer data of colorectal cancer screening participation by age, including at uh, younger ages here over the coming years. Uh, we look forward to that. It, with respect to quality measures, we anticipate that the 
uh, age 45 will be part of colorectal cancer screening quality measures by somewhere around 2023. Great. Uh, Dr. Lindbergh, Dr. Brooks, thanks so much. Uh, on behalf of Exact Sciences, thank you uh, so much to the Prevent Cancer Foundation and to all of you uh, for taking time out of your day to join us today. And again, if we didn't get to your question, uh, please feel free to follow up with us via email. Again, thanks so much.